call the mm. December 3rd Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to order. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. A um, couple housekeeping mm -hmm. notes. Uh, Wayne Dias will not be able to be at our meeting today, so a few items. Buford will be our substitute school teacher for today, so um, he, he's last minute, but I think he's got everything together. Also, uh, we do have two items, uh, extensions uh, for Old Battles Village subdivision um, items in Fairhope Falls that will come up under new business at the end of the meeting. Uh, we will do the approval of the minutes at the next meeting. So without further ado, the first item on the agenda is, what is the um, agenda item number? Um, SD 18.41, Village at Fire Okay. So that's not the one that changed then. In your packet, Beaver's going to go over that. Okay, in the packet. Okay, 1841, a request to fire Thorn for a final plat approval. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to tonight's uh, compatibility analysis discussion. <laughs> and uh, we will lead off, we will lead off with a final plat approval. And SD 18.41, Village at Fire Thorn, as Ms. Emily mentioned a moment ago, my apologies for... Uh, a labeling incorrection in your packet. Uh, to refresh the commission member's memory, this is one half mile east of State Highway 181, um, just beyond east of the Twin Beach Road where Twin Beach Road terminates. You'll see the property owners there on the slide as this is uh, a, po a portion of that was added to the Firethorn development. What I'd like to do here is just briefly uh, refresh the uh, the Planning Commission's members about the case history. So we began with a zoning change, which was a conditional annexation and rezoning to PUD. That was approved by the Fairhope City Council August 13th of this year. That case number ZC 18.03, Zulu Charlie 18.03. The subdivision case that you saw preceding was SD 18.17. That was the preliminary plat of this Firethorn subdivision. This is called the Village at Firethorn that this commission approved on May 7th of this year. A brief reintroduction of the property, 6.27 acres, 20 lots, resulting in 3.19 uh, units per acre density. You see the largest and smallest lots shown there on your slide, the parent parcel number, that created this, that originated this subdivision is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, what I'd like to call your attention to here on this slide, the drawing on the left is the plat of the subdivision. The drawing on the far right is zoomed out to show the entire Firethorn development. You'll notice in the lower right hand corner of the large scale drawing, the village at Firethorn that we're considering tonight is shown in a very light beige color. The full site data table is in the center of the slide. If there's any questions going back to the approval of the subdivision, we need to go into greater detail. We can utilize that site data table. Just a very brief rundown of the final plat criteria. The video inspections of the infrastructure were submitted satisfactory. The performance bond was submitted as requested. The commission will note that 228 linear feet, linear feet of sidewalks were installed as a part of the subdivision construction. The remaining amounts you see on your slide there will be part of the performance bond, as well as the willow oak trees for the street trees. The maintenance bond was submitted. You see the bond number from the bonding company. The various inspection reports regarding the subgrade and granular base necessary to, ba to create the paving in the subdivision, as well as concrete, were all furnished and are satisfactory. And then finally, the power, the electrical, pi the electrical provider for this uh, subdivision is Baldwin EMC, which that was left energized as of November 16th of this year. So therefore, our staff recommendation is approval of this case, again, SD 18.41, which is the final plat approval. We have a few, you'll see listed right there, a few punch list items which are conditions of approval. These are minor routine punch list items, um, not uncommon for a subdivision of this type. 
uh, Planning Commission members, I'm happy to answer questions about the case. And also, uh, Mr. Steve Pumphrey with Dewberry is here as well to answer questions based upon the uh, app, uh, to answer questions on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Buford. Do we have any questions for staff while he's up? Um, if not, this is a public hearing, so I'll go ahead and open the public hearing before I call. Well, I don't see Steve here, is he? Oh, there he is behind the computer. Steve, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing just to see if there are any questions and may or may not call you up. Um, uh, public hearing open. Anybody have anything to say about this item? If not, I'll close the public hearing at this time and turn this over to the directors. Director Steve is in the audience if you have any questions for him. If not, um, I will accept a motion. Motion, Mr. Chairman. Second. I've got a motion to approve the staff recommendation and a second. A second. Uh, and a second. Is there any further discussion? In that case, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. All right. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing to consider the request of Mike Fogel to resume property from R2 medium density single family residential to be for business and professional district. The uh, land is out uh, near the new roundabout. And I would like to say one thing just to the audience in general um, on zoning items. The Planning and Zoning Commission simply makes a recommendation to the City Council and ultimately the City Council decides whether or not the zoning change will be made. The zoning uh, is actually an ordinance, so we don't have the authority to make an ordinance one way or the other. So we will simply make a recommendation <coughs> to the City Council who may or may not accept our recommendation. Nancy? Thank you. Um, this is a request for rezoning from R2 to B4. It is uh, the acreage, there's two parcels involved. The acreage is 2.8 acres. Um, Mr. Fogel contends, oh, it's at the intersect, southwest corner of intersection of County Road 13 and Fairhope Avenue. Um, Mr. Fogel contends that the development of the gas station across the street and the roundabout provided burden for his, he and his family due to traffic issues and losses of that residential feel. Um, this particular site, if uh, you all have driven by, it has a large pond on the site. Um, and it lies between two village nodes, um, Green O and Fairhope Avenue intersection, and then Highway 181 and um, Fairhope Avenue, which are less than two miles apart. Um, the subject property is uh, not located at these locations. We realize that um, the subject property to the north is unzoned. Um, so there is that potential for commercial to go in it. Right now, there's mostly um, residential with the exception of the storage facility and um, the gas station. Um, let's see. But the main concern about this is uh, to change that zoning would create commercial creep, that potential for the um, business to kind of creep into the residential neighborhood. And to the south of that um, Fairhope Avenue is all residential. It's R1, um, rural agricultural, and R2 in that vicinity. And so that's what our concern is, and we recommend a denial for that reason. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Is there anyone here who would like to speak on behalf of the um, applicant? Is that Mr. Fogel? Yes, sir. Um, I'm Mike Fogel, and we. Uh, Is this mic on? Yes. Yes. I'm Mike Fogel, and we uh, bought this purchase. My parents bought this property back in '02, and uh, built the pond. My <coughs> father built it. Uh, we've been in construction with in doing site work and that type of business for about 40 years. And when we purchased the property, it was supposed to be just a residential home site. Uh, my mother here is 86 and she has been living there. My father passed away in 12. And it, when the 
they came and did the uh, eminent domain on the corner, it threw the curve in the road, which dumps the traffic coming from downtown Fairhope to Walmart, uh, and the turns to the right going south are all thrown to our uh, to our side, and there's no there's no stopping, there's no let up at all whatsoever. And I've called and talked to the uh, uh, gentleman with the highway about possible uh, speed breakers, police to come out. We've we've called them several times. They come and people will slow down for a little while, and then it starts back again. But the problem too is the speed limit around that curve's 20. And when they come out of there doing 30 and 40, uh, not letting up, our driveway is directly in line and it's blinded by the shrubbery and everything around the curve there. And I'm afraid she's gonna end up getting killed. And our neighbors, or, or anybody that comes to visit has trouble getting in and out. Our, uh, uh, we get some nice gestures and horn blowing a lot from people coming through. And uh, that was the reason I came to the city to ask for some help. And they, I, my understanding was maybe possibly go to a residential, a, a light commercial type of property like a doctor's office or something to make it, you know, confide with the area but not encroach. And the fact is the way the property lays, we could still own property on the uh, south side. We own, the, uh, but do something right on that corner, business-like, that would take in this traffic situation, letting the people come in, coming uh, from Fairhope, turn in onto the Marathon gas side in on the property to the right and exit on the property going south um, at the other end of the property and make it where there would be a, a zone in there for people, it would be safe for everybody. The other thing was maybe possibly the city helped put a driveway in for us to have access to move. We didn't, the gentleman on the other side I think had Baldwin County do something for him but he knew what was going on about the, the uh, traffic, how it was going to be, and we did not have any idea. So that's my story. I don't know what else to tell you. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'll go ahead and open the public hearing at this time. Does anybody want to speak to the request to rezone R2 medium density to B4 um, on Fairhope Avenue on the southwest intersection of the roundabout. Mr. Turner, uh, Chairman, I would like to say that I did receive a call from Ms. Robinson who lives nearby and she was not in favor of the request. Okay. Uh, if nobody wishes to speak at this time, in that case, I will close the public hearing and turn the item over to the commissioners. Is it that the traffic has increased because of this roundabout? Because Route 13 is being developed more and more as a major road, where in the past it was really not usually that much. So I'm trying to figure out this impact, whether it comes because of the additional traffic or the roundabout. I personally wouldn't have put a roundabout and a gas station together at the same place, because I don't want you looking at the gas price when you're going around a roundabout, but that's me. But I'm just curious, is it more traffic that's causing the problem or the fact that it's a different yes. geometry coming out of there? Both. There seems to be a lot more traffic. Can you come back to the microphone? Both. There seems to be a lot more traffic, especially during school times. Uh, the traffic used to back up at the stoplight, yeah, at the did. stop sign, back up. Uh, down south on, on, off from between Morphy and Fairhope Avenue used to back up in front of us, which wasn't any big deal because they had to stop. Now everybody's hitting the circle and they don't, nobody stops. 
they just fly off and you don't have time to even judge when to pull out of the driveway. And it's the same thing in the morning at work time. You'll have 10 cars fly by and you just kind of jump out if you have a chance to get out. And then, but even all day long, uh, some reason a lot of people seem to like it. Uh, guys with hot rods or, you know, loud cars, they love to fly out of that circle and make a lot of noise going around it, like a race yeah. car curve, and it kind of makes it a little aggravating yeah. on top of everything else. Plus, we were right there when the shooting hit, when the shooting at the Marathon Station, I was in the front yard, walked around. I mean, I was in the backyard and heard the shooting, and I walk out, and this guy's laying dead in the drive, in the, right across the street. My mom was inside. I told her to stay in the house and don't come out and I went out and they were over there the officers had him laying in the ditch rolling him around and you know it just wasn't like the old way it used to be four stop you know stop signs two stop signs and everybody had to slow down to ease through the area Thank you. Um, I have a question you currently the 2.84 acres is that all the land that you have at that location we had, yes, it was 3.18, but the eminent domain took the corner to get us below three acres. Ken, and if they wanted to come under a PUD application, not they don't have the full three acres, but they had it prior to the eminent domain, would that possibly be a, any kind of a hardship, or would we have the ability to approve a, a PUD or would that just be a closed door? I would want to look at that before I gave a definitive answer, of course. It might turn on how the county acquired. I acquired that land for the county. I do the county's condemnation work. If they retain the underlying fee so that they might still have the underlying fee in the part that was turned into right-of-way, then that might be an argument to get them up to the three acres. Mm -hmm. I would need to look into that. I was just, you know, our PUD ordinance allows, uh, is a rezoning that allows, if you have over three acres, to bring in an, a proposal and show um, what that proposal is. I just, the, you know, I understand, uh, you know, everything you're saying, I can't disagree with anything, but then, you know, from our perspective, you you take an area that you say is, you know, there's a concern about driving and take it from a residential house with one car to, you know, business with 100 cars coming in and out with all that traffic. It's, you know, for the safety aspect, it's kind of a counterintuitive for the overall. Well, the location of the drive would make it a lot of difference. Well, that's why I was saying, you know, you with know. a PUD, a PUD is a specific zoning where then, you know, we rezone it and we don't know if somebody's going to come in and hack it up or do a good job on it, where if it's a PUD, we know exactly what would be done. But again, a PUD, you have to have three acres mm -hmm. to present, and that would be something that I would, you know, be a lot more. In. Another in thing that's been brought up by Nancy is the fact that my father built that pond, and it was built in 02, and there was just a little stream running through there. Now that falls under, what is it? Well, there's concern. I talked to um, the building official about this, and his concern is it's going to be very expensive to um, develop that property simply because that pond is really deep, and it's, it's going to be a, a challenge site is one of the concerns. Okay. That doesn't affect I'll, the zoning I'll, side I'll of things, but... But, well, it doesn't affect the zoning side of it, but it does affect, you know, considerations for future um, PUDs or whatever at that location. I did talk to Wayne about the PUD, and he, he um, did not, he didn't really say no, but he, he said you have to have, per our ordinance, you have to have three acres to go that direction. So, um, and I did talk to also the building official mentioned that they did work with the homeowners on the driveways at one point in time and that he said that they didn't y'all didn't want the driveway changed 
So, um, oh, no, that's not true. Okay, I just, I'm, well, like I'm I said, not, okay, I'm telling but, yeah. but that, that was kind of the issue of the driveway. So. It's been a while. I, I, I just don't remember. My recollection is we only had to condemn one of those quadrants. Did you recall whether you, whether you were that one or, or did you convey that property by deed to the county? I don't know. I think you, you met with you met with my brother, Eddie, who lives on Gafer. At the time, I, when this was taking place, I was basically living in Birmingham. I, I and think we bought that by deed, which would mean we took fee simple title. And we might have taken fee simple title if we condemned it. The county usually does. Okay. Which would mean I, there would be under the three acres. More like, more than like, I mean, I don't, can't give you a definitive answer, but more likely than not, they're going to be under the three acres. <laughs> That's something, if that's something you all want to pursue, we can always, if he um, was willing to table it, that's something that perhaps we could research um, from Ken's side. If that's I wanted to say about the pond area and the watershed, uh, there was a small swamp. That was basically a swamp area and a creek running through it. And my father took it upon himself back then. There weren't as many rules and regulations. And uh, he hired somebody to come in and dig the pond. And we had built lakes up in Birmingham, uh, a, a, th a 23 and a 20 acre lake we built up there. And uh, the fall from the road, where the ro water comes under the road at the gas station to the far end of the property that where Crittenden lives is the old creek bed still lays, it's still there. And it, judging just looking at it, you're probably looking at about six feet of fall across that 400 feet that you're talking about. So it's not like it's gonna, if you, if you open the dam back up and put it back the way it used to be, it wouldn't be, you know, as, I'm just saying in a commercial aspect. You could, the gas station across the street just stuck pipes in the ground and covered them up, dumped it over on us, and we could continue the pipes right on down. You know, if you wanted, if you, if that was a problem, watershed-wise, mm -hmm. is all I'm saying as far as that goes. Excuse me, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes, before you, before you go, the when they put the roundabout in, I'm just trying to understand this a little bit better, but. When they put the roundabout in, the driveway as I see it on this picture right here is, is accurate. That's right? Yes. So yep. when they put the roundabout in, you still can't get out of this driveway on, on, uh, on 13? No, it, that's, but it, it, what happens is when they cut the new right-of-way to make the, the circle coming off Fairhope Avenue, they took the front of the property off our, of, of our property there. They took the front mm -hmm. and made that a sharp right turn. Uh -huh. And right at the end of the right turn is where the, they stopped and it straightens up to head down 13 to right. Morphe. And that's where they come around that curve and you don't even have any straight view. I mean, they're just basically flying around the corner and you, you can't yeah, see the, out. Or you the can't photographs we've got don't, they were taking pre, pre uh, uh, circle Correct. construction, so I mean we can't really see the way that uh, that fits in here. But you're saying your driveway is on a curve. It it's is on at a the curve tip, and the tip of the curve. They stopped when they put the right of way in. They 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 restaked the right of way and put a curve in the property. Right. One of the one of the new stakes is right at one side of the driveway and on the other side of the driveway you're starting to straighten back up and run straight south towards Morphe and there's two pins in the ground right there that are new right-of-way stakes that they put in if your driveway was moved further south would that eliminate the yes problem? Sir, it would help a lot yes okay that's what I would originally had hoping you know we're not I, I certainly I, I don't I don't see where I'm, I'm very familiar with that roundabout but I don't I don't see where the roundabout is in relationship to your driveway because of this photograph 
but it seems to me that there there certainly is room to your driveway would be have to be reconfigured somewhat. Yes, sir. Yes, but sir. it if seems to me that you end. move it further south and solve the problem associated with 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 traffic right there. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I did try on page three. You'll see. I tried to get a photograph that. I mean, it's it's not the best, but I tried to get one that kind of mm -hmm. provides a reference of, of distance. There is a good bit of distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like 200 feet of property frontage below the driveway now. 200 feet down the road, and it's still but, yours. Yes, sir. But what it is, let me explain that too. There are two parcels there. Mm -hmm. Right. When my father bought the property back in '02. The, the south end, there's 186 feet that right. is like a little half acre parcel. Right. I but see we it. own it. We owned it. We've owned it since 02. Mm -hmm. I own it all now. I bought it from, I'm in the purchasing it from my mother. And I own all of it. So I could work any way I needed to in order, you know, as far as there wouldn't be any discrepancies in any property lines or anything. As far as you know, having trouble legally doing this, if we just all could get together and well, do let me, it, you let me, know. not let me, just don't go away. But okay. who is uh, which highway department is it that we would uh, that, that would be responsible? Baldwin. Excuse me, Baldwin County. Baldwin County. Yeah, uh, I think they de okay. needed that to the city. <clears throat> that, sorry, section, that section of 13, I think, has been deeded to the city. It so that would be us? Y'all? You? I think the Richard city Johnson. paved it. Just yeah. didn't oh, know, it would be Richard. It. Don't hide down there behind the chair. If you got something to add, come on up here. <laughs> up to Mosley Road, if my recollection is correct. That's, I believe yes, that's right. To the city. <laughs> Thought you could sneak down there, couldn't you? <laughs> And I'm not going to attest to who, who said or did what, but the standard procedure on all the roundabouts, the two that I have been involved with, the two that have been done so far, was that the offer always was that all the property owners, they would relocate and build a new driveway apron. And in this case, they did it on two of the four quadrants so that it pushes that entrance as far away from the tangent of the roundabout for safety purposes. All right. I was told by the county engineer that this property owner did not want that and, did not, and declined that opportunity to have that, that apron reestablished as far as away from the tangent of the roundabout as possible. Now, I'm not going to okay. say that, that that is the absolute truth or whatever, but that well, was what was conveyed to me. That, so. That's sort of just out there. But, uh, but in this situation, is 13 uh, uh, the city's responsibility now? That is correct. Okay, so if... If uh, if the city wanted to work with Mr. Fogel, um, maybe y'all could figure something out. Help that, him. Help. That, that's always a possibility. But understand, is is our our role would have to end at the right of way line, meaning that we'd have no issue with establishing a new apron as far south of the terminus or the the tangent of that roundabout into his property. But our construction and work would end at his property line, and then he would be responsible for picking up the driveway and taking it from wherever it, to connect it back to the existing ones. But but I, probably where where you come off of the high off of 13, certainly the, uh, I'm sure there'd probably be a culvert that would need to be installed there maybe. I don't, I, I don't it's, think it's, like it's, it's, it's flat as a pancake. Flat there, as a think, pancake. So, uh, yeah. Well, and the pancakes you'd have to put in there would. Let, what they did, re, when they did the, uh, right, uh, did this, the cul-de-sac or circle. They did take out my mother's pipes on her driveway and re, re poured that section because of, for some reason, uh, I don't know, that superintendent you had out there? The uh, county was over that job, uh, so that wasn't, uh, that wasn't us. So. Oh, are you, are you, no, the, when, you when, city? Richard's with, with the city. city. Oh, okay, okay, I got you, okay. okay. Oh. Yeah, all right. What it was when they when they came around the curve, they kept they approached us and said we are going to have to replace these pipes that on my on my mother's driveway. Okay. And they did tear them out, did some dirt digging of the ditch because it's really a deep ditch now around the around towards the marathon station. That's turned into a 
you have to hand weed eat it where it used to be we could mow it. That's how deep they dug it around. But anyway, that let the water fall from her driveway back around the pond and going into the pond and on around I understand. that way. So, uh -huh. but they did, there was, it was cut and there was work done at that time to the driveway. Okay. Uh, we're, we're getting a little bit down a rabbit trail. Our, our discussion is not how to get them safely in or out of the driveway or how to redo their driveway. Our question is, does this property need to be changed from R2 medium density to B4, um, basically business and office? So, um, yes, ma'am. Just for us to be sure that we realize that in a year or so we're going to have an, another school on Fairhope Avenue that's going to be more traffic as well. So just mm -hmm. keep that in mind. I wanted to speak to the zoning. I mean, I, I while I, I can see that things have changed and I understand how the, the traffic issue, um, the zoning, like you said, seems like a counterintuitive way to address it to introduce more traffic um, or more, you know, occupants into the property, especially as it's divided into two properties, um, you know, where you're not solving the traffic issue. So I appreciate uh, looking for an alternative to rezoning, you know, whether it's the city working with the driveway or some other mechanism to kind of solve the problem. Um, rezoning seems like it might open a can of worms in the domino effect. Then your neighbors will be here next saying, yeah. well, because that happened, now we want to do, you know. Um, I've been approached already by the the person caddy corner across, and I said, I don't think you're even in the city, well, so you won't have to worry. And yeah. he, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> he left. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I think if you have more traffic, you have people that live in places that don't want more traffic where they live, and businesses seem to like to be located where there's more traffic and I think we, there's a place that we zoned commercial just across from Highway 27 Grill that was as far away from the node of 181 and Ferrop Avenue as this is from 181 and Ferrop Avenue. I mean, I can see business being an appropriate use here. I mean, I, you know, I'm no planner and I, you know, don't, everybody don't, Shoot me, and I'm, I'm just the messenger. Of where, you know, I, I see residential people complaining because we're putting commercial on Greeno Road. That's we think should be commercial. I mean, I, mm -hmm. so one thing I want to now you got residential people that want to make commercial, and we're not wanting them to do that. I think I, one of Wayne's concerns was that there's a clear line of delineation to the north is the natural direction for that growth to go because it is unzoned and it's but from the south you have a whole lot of residential I mean, right it's a pretty residential block and and, so and if you're going to buffer residential from commercial the b4 designation is i mean it's not a gas station okay. it's not a drive-in restaurant i mean you know if, it, if you want to buffer and i don't know i hear again i'm no planner i don't know how that should work but i i see that as a natural transition to what's there almost would uh it, part of part of the concern too is that they're two properties so if you rezone them both there's no there, you know there's no guarantee that you're not going to have the driveway in the same place that it is now the driveway let's forget about okay driveway's got nothing to do with rezoning okay. this property be redeveloped this zoning another zoning or Whatever well, they can, they can move the driveway if they want to. If they've got an issue with the driveway and the safety, they can move the driveway. That's all a rabbit trail we're talking about. Whether this should be B four or not. I, I see the proximity to the cul-de-sac is a <coughs> detriment for the zoning because of the, their two properties, which leads to a driveway. <laughs> but it's not just one. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, any further questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Well, I, I made a motion before that wasn't seconded, so I'll make a motion we recommend to the council to approve the B4 zoning. Do I have a second? 
Uh, motion to ask for a lack of a second. Do I have any other motions? Yeah, I would make a motion. I'd make a motion, and certainly I think there's an alternative, sir, uh, at, at least at this juncture, for uh, leaving this area south of Farrell Avenue residential, but helping Mr. Fogel with his uh, with his driveway if at all possible. But I would make a recommendation to, uh, or I would make a motion to recommend to the city council denial of the uh, change to a B4 zoning designation. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Nay. All right. We got that in we? Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the wait, agenda. Wait, Mr. Chairman, the city council, the only ones that, as Chairman adequately stated earlier, the only ones that can change the zoning. Yes. So you can certainly talk to them and we just make a recommendation. Thank you. Yes, sir, Buford. And Chairman Commissioners, the next item we have for you is a zoning change. And this is case number ZC 18.14, Zulu Charlie 18.14. This property is located on 51 South Church Street. And you'll see the property called out both in your packet as well as in the left hand zoning map on your slide. You'll also see the aerial image on your right. Um, you notice this is the intersection of Church Street and Delamar. This does fall within the Central Business District. And uh, commissioners, forgive me if I stumble through this item just a moment because I may not have every single point that Mr. Dice wanted to share with you. But if you notice here, the zoning change request is to change from B1 Local Shopping District to B2 General Business District. And what I'd like to do for, for the Commission's benefit and also for our audience is I want to read an item out of your packet. If you look at page two of your packet, and it has both the B1 and the B2 uh, descriptions in your packet, but it also has some of Wayne's commentary. So what I'd like to do is read to you. This summarizes the request much better than I could uh, stumbling through the uh, stumbling through the uh, uh, slides. But if you notice, the purpose of requested B2 is, and it gives you the definition of B2. Notice Wayne's commentary underneath there. The applicant stated in a meeting with staff that the intended development goal for that property was to allow the historic home to remain, the, uh, the home that you see in the aerial image right there. And we'll show you some photos. There's also a photo of that home on this slide right here. Um, intended development goal for properties to allow the historic home to remain, but to allow for a restaurant bar use in the structure. The exterior and the historical character would be unchanged with only interior renovations and a change in use. Uh, currently, B1 zoning allows, uh, only allows a restaurant through an appeal through the Zoning Board of Adjustments, but a bar as a primary use is not allowed in B1 under any circumstances. So a restaurant with an accessory bar is allowed in B2 district by right, but an accessory bar is considered part of a restaurant. Uh, a bar as a primary use is defined as a business serving alcoholic beverage, which may be include accessory food and entertainment services. Uh, so therefore, for the intended and desired development of this piece of property, the applicant's requesting that it be rezoned from B1 to B2. So that way, the uses associated with B2 would be allowed by right on the property. And if you'll notice in the zoning map, this is consistent with the nearby because a good portion of this area is zoned B2. Um, and is a consistent zoning request and a logical progression of this area. If you look at the various restaurant bar uses nearby the area, uh, Chairman Commissioners, the you notice some ground level, street level photos um, on this particular slide. Again, the historic nature of the structure. It is, uh, if memory serves correct, it's not an historic structure, it's a contributing structure. If I could throw in yes, there real yes, sir. quickly. I was stunned when I saw this on the agenda that that wasn't B2. I thought it was B2 yeah. all the way down to yes, the, sir. To the um, park, and I've got no problem with this being B2. Yes, sir. I think that whole area could be rezoned B2 and clean the map up. But I think we need to quit talking about the existing structure because 
they could come in and bulldoze that tomorrow. And so I want everybody right. here to understand yeah. we approve this, hold hands and sing Kumbaya so they can save this beautiful existing structure. And the day after we do it, they can bulldoze it and do whatever fits into B2. So don't go for the so don't go for the existing structure. Decide whether B two makes more sense than B one because whether this developer or right. the next one, there's no deed restriction. There's no historic restriction. This thing, you know, if they get in there and it's got termites and the builder says, hey, this thing's going to cost more to renovate than to start new, it's gone. Mm -hmm. I got a question for you. I got involved in a lawsuit like this some years back in New Orleans. How do you define an accessory bar? And is it a bar that only serves during the time that the restaurant is serving food, or, or does it become a bar that's separate and stays on way after? I mean, we got into that. I don't know how your regulations, is, I would have looked this up beforehand. It just occurred to me I should ask this question. And so, uh, uh, Emily, could you uh, illuminate what you were mentioning just a moment ago? And um, she knows it much better than I do off the top of her head. The business license application um, is based on a percentage of sales, how it is how it's listed with the city. So is Dragonfly and Fly Bar a, an example of an accessory bar? Across I don't know the how their business license is listed. I would think the Dragonfly, yeah. just off the cuff, would be an accessory bar, and then the Fly Bar would be an actual bar itself. So the Fly okay. Bar serves food; you can eat at it. So I don't know. But the percentages would be real low, I would think, okay. compared to the other. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for that. And and I stumbled I stumbled across it. But but as you were stating, uh, this is a contributing structure, not an historic structure. Right. Well, um, my issue is just I, I don't even know why we even talk about the structure being there, yeah. because there's nothing. I mean, we're we're talking about that to me is again. I keep using the word rabbit trail today. We're talking about, do we want to zone this from B1 to B2? And I don't give a damn about that structure because there's nothing guaranteeing that structure's there. So even showing the structure, it just to me is, is something, I mean, I, you know, I, I, can, we can, I, I can point to 30 brand new buildings, most of which look very nice, that where we approve zoning changes, where the structure that we approve the zoning change for is no longer there. Mm -hmm. um, and I can take you all, anybody who wants to ride with me and go on a field trip afterwards, I'll point them out. But anyway, my point is simply B1 to B2, let's forget about the structure. Yes, sir. And so, Chairman, what I'll, con what I'll conclude with is that uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, applicant as well as the uh, engineer of record uh, representing the uh, applicant, they are here as well for uh, questions okay. um, if, um, if I can't answer any more. All right. Thank you. Does anybody have questions for Buford while he's up? I do. Yes, ma'am. Buford, if it doesn't matter, why don't we put it in there about preserving historic since we don't have any kind of historic preservation? Why are we? And Ms. McKellar, I think probably uh, when Wayne was preparing the item, he felt that was a relevant and appropriate uh, background supporting information. We try to, when we write these agenda items, we try to anticipate all the questions and and be able to answer your questions and be able to put it on the screen. And he felt that was relevant um, to make certain, as Mr. Turner was saying, that we at least illuminate because the question will be asked, it has a Baldwin County plaque on the front of the building. What does that mean? So uh, he felt so, compelled to so illuminate that. So if Wayne feels that it is something of importance, is it something that we need to move forward with in the future? preserving some kind of historic preservation, some architectural committee that we do not have? That is an excellent question. That is an outstanding question and probably a good topic for a future work session. I know we keep saying the future, but uh, I mean, we need to put it on a, on a deadline so it's not two years from here and we have no historic preservation of anything to preserve anymore. So um, not that it's important to anybody else, um, maybe, but, yes, you know, um, he seems, to, he is our city planner. I look to him for guidance. If he sees that this is something that is of importance to put in what's presented to us, I would like to kind of look into that a little bit more. So noted. Thank you. So noted. Thank you. You forgot a question for you. Um, yes, ma'am. You know, just to speak to the... Um, well, yeah, uh, also, you know, 
love historic buildings, but appreciate. I think I think what what you're trying to say is that that's muddying the waters because if we if we if we don't think purely about the zoning, but we think about the beautiful structure um, and make our decision based on that, they can still do whatever they want. No, I think it's very nice to know. I think it's nice to know the background and the motivation yeah. of what they're doing. And it's nice, but I just want everybody to know to be clear. in the real world. And we do have a historic preservation and, yeah. you know, um, uh, ordinance, and it's very loose. I remember we've talked about historic preservation in Fairhope numerous times, and one issue is we don't have a, you know, Matt could give us a seminar on this, but we don't have a set architecture. We've got, you know, some of the Dyson Spanish buildings that came in, some of the Iowa buildings from the first single taxers, mm -hmm. but there's not a set um, architecture that we can define as this is Fairhope, like you would have in St. Augustine or some of these, you know, Santa Fe and some other places. And whenever we've talked about historic preservation, I'll get calls saying, you know, your parents will never be able to repaint the Pittman building if historic preservation comes in and it gets very, very, very contentious very quickly because people with buildings like this get concerned about, well, gosh, you know, this building might generate X thousand dollars a month rent on this property. If I bulldoze it and put an 8,000 square foot building there, it'll generate four or five times that. So people start getting real nervous, but there is a pretty loosey-goosey historic preservation. Um, and I didn't mean to go back that, that down the had. rabbit hole. I just I couldn't resist saying something no. about it. And there are, there are good incentives that might be another way to get there, mm -hmm. the incentives. Um, I, 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 I had a question about the zoning, because you mentioned how muddy the zoning is. I was, I was surprised to see that the whole Church Street was R2, and there's restaurants there. You know, the, I, I'm curious, what, what do we do about, we've got uh, restaurants and inns and the B1, and then we've got a bunch of restaurants and the, uh, the mixed-use development. Um, you know, I, I also don't have any problem with the zoning change, but I'm, I, I just look at everything else around it that's non-compliant and wonder how do we get to a point where it's very clear what is allowed in oh, each the kind of Oh, restaurants aren't on R2. That's the school property there. Okay, that's not... Yes, yes if you look the southwest... Restaurant, the restaurant stops at that road. Exactly. It's, it's the pink up above. is the two-story multi-use Okay, the pink up above building. is... Okay. Exactly. So the, uh, the K-1 center... So then it's just tr the... Fairhope Inn and all of that. Yes, ma'am. If you not quite, okay. yes, the bright red you see in your zoning map right there, and and commissioners, you know, obviously we are your your staff is synthesizing a great deal of information right now among those items, the visual <laughs> preference study, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I certainly expect that you'll continue to see continued future recommendations for enhancements and changes to the zoning ordinance, subdivision regulations, et cetera, as a natural progression as we're evaluating this and a whole constellation of issues, uh, have two issues, uh, two issues for discussion today um, about possible changes. So, so, so we certainly hear the mandate, we certainly understand it, and that's the, these recommendations you're seeing are part of that, and all of these are fantastic, uh, fantastic pieces of feedback that are duly noted. Um, that we will certainly synthesize into some kind of recommendation into the future. Thank you, Buford. Um, would anybody like to speak on behalf of the applicant in this case? Yes, my name is Larry Smith. I'm a civil engineer um, for the project. Um, just want to clarify, make sure everybody understands. Um, we are obviously on the corner there. Um, currently, it's B1. All the red below is B1, and the peach pink is B2. Um, that surrounds us on three sides. And so we're just looking to come into compliance with the zoning or be more conforming with the zoning that surround us and the uses that are around us. Um, and I won't get into any historic. That's all right. Thank you. Any questions for Larry while he's here? If not, I will open the public hearing at this time. Anybody wish to speak to this item? And mostly the people that do historic stuff is mainly for cost of taxes. They try to save on their taxes on their colony rent. So mm -hmm. that's the main purpose. Most people get a plaque for historical stuff. Yeah, it cuts your taxes in half if you get a historic plaque, by the way. Um, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, 
Regarding the historic uh, nature of the property, um, it is located within an, an historic district. The uh, downtown district is an historic district on the Na uh, National Register of Historic Places. Correct. That's another angle on the uh, uh, need to think about uh, historic preservation. Well, the we passed a historic ordinance back when it um, so people could get uh, funding for doing historic renovations and also for a um, for a grant that the city of Fairhope got back probably eight nine years ago, and I haven't looked at the historic. <coughs> I haven't looked at that in so long, I can't even remember what it says now. But I remember it was done pretty loosely because there was a lot of animosity and a lot of distrust when, when we were looking at that. I'm not aware of that, the existence of such an ordinance. Well, that's what you're talking so about, I, what, created that, what created that historic district. That's the ordinance I'm discussing. I'll talk to you after the meeting about okay. it, but, but that's what created that historic district and a couple of others. It's not a real in-depth ordinance at all. Um, okay. Matt could explain a lot of it to us. Um, I'll go ahead and... Um, Mr. Chairman, yes, I would like to say that the owner of Gene Spain's property also spoke with me today, and they are in favor of the rezoning. And they're direct... No, there's a parcel in between them. Next door, they're directly adjacent to this property. Thank you. All right, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing at this time um, and turn this meeting over to the commissioners. Um, you know, my only comment would be just interjecting real quickly. You know, we always say, well, what if the property next door wanted to do the same thing? And my argument would be I would say yes, 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 um, all the way down to the Fairhope Inn, which would take us to the park, which would be a natural place to stop. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any problem with that entire strip being um, B2. It's all in the business, central business district, and I was surprised at what it was mm -hmm. when, the, when I saw this in my um, agenda on Friday. Motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, case number ZC18.14. I would uh, move that we recommend approval to the city council. Do I have a second? I have a second. Any further discussion? I just, I don't have any problem with there's a bar right across the street and there's the same kind of complexes all up and down the road. I just wonder why we have so many restrictions and uses in a central business district and we don't change the, the allowable uses within a central business district to include some of the stuff that's obviously supposed to be there. Well, that's, what, that's why I think it would be, be nice to change that the whole zoning to be too. I agree. Um, all, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Um, motion for the rec recommendation to City Council is unanimous. Uh, next item on the agenda, uh, a request of John Bethay on behalf of Bethay LLC for a site plan review for Founders Square. Good evening, Planning Commission. Uh, Mike Jeffries, Plan Technician for the City of Fairhope. What we have before you today is a site plan review for Founder Square, case number 18.06. The owner and applicant, John Bethay, is here with us today to answer any questions. Uh, and he's on behalf of Bethay LLC, and he's working with architect Mike Lebatar on the proposed project. Uh, the application is as a modification to an existing site plan called Founder Square, which was originally developed by Mike Bernhardt and approved by the Planning Commission December 4th, 2006, and approved by the City Council January 22nd of 2007. The original development had three total phases. Phase one and phase two were both completed. Phase three had all the infrastructure installed, but nothing further than that, and it's set vacant since then. Uh, the requested modifications are to, the, are to this incomplete phase three, which is about 0.2 acres, and they are considered substantial in regards to Fairhope zoning ordinance, but exceed those which could be approved administratively pursuant to Fairhope zoning ordinance, Article 2.C.2.F. Uh, therefore, this site plan modification is being presented for approval pursuant to the original procedure required by Fairhope zoning ordinance, Article 2.C.2. Uh, planning Commission, as you know, will make review and make a recommendation 
uh, to the city council who will make the final decision. Have for you on the screen now is just very similar to what you just saw as far as maps go. This is just right around the corner off of Section Street here. You have your zoning map on the left and the aerial on the right side of your screen. It's sites located on the west side of South Section Street, approximately 400 feet north of the intersection of Morphy Avenue and Second Street there. Uh, the proposed amendment would allow the development of two buildings which mirror each other. There are both two stories with a breezeway connecting the two on the second floor. They're separated by a common wall that won't have direct access to each other. Uh, each of these buildings contains three units. The bottom floors will each have two commercial units with the second floors each having one residential unit. Uh, the common area in between them will remain, which will connect the first two phases to Second Street between the buildings. Here on the screen, I have what was the existing approved site plan next to the proposed site plan. And really the general layout is just about the same. On the left side, highlighted in purple, uh, are the commercial uses that were to be there. And in yellow is the residential uses. Uh, and on the left, what was approved before was actually five separate lots. And Mr. Bethea has replatted it into two lots, so that way his two buildings won't be encroaching over any lot lines or anything in that common area in the middle where the breezeway will be. We'll have a fire rated wall per fire, uh, the fire code. And we spoke with Eric Cortinas, the building official, about that and went over the particulars on what would be needed to do to make that uh, work for us. Here's just a second picture kind of showing the outline and general layout of the two different buildings, one on the north and one on the south. And in the middle, you can't see on this picture is where that breezeway would be. And in front of it on Section Street is a required eight foot sidewalk. Next picture is kind of a, is a front elevation view, giving you what it would look like from Section Street looking at it. It's well underneath the uh, height restrictions that are currently in the CBD. And like I said, the development has the same proposed use and general configuration as the previously approved site plan. Uh, the biggest significant change is the reduction of the number of residential units from four to two, or for, yeah, from four to two, and the number of parking spaces from eight to two. Now the eight spaces that were in the original site plan was double that of what was required for their site plan. Uh, and the two spaces that are proposed meet the parking re uh, requirements right now. Uh, SAS recommendation is to approve with the following conditions. Uh, a hold harmless agreement shall be signed and recorded for a balcony overhang that's onto the city property and the balcony must contain lighting for the sidewalks. And with that back on the view, you can kind of tell there's there are balconies that will come over the sidewalk, just a just little stoop a that come over mm -hmm. there, which is allowed in the central business district. Slate, and that's where the hold harmless idea. agreement uh, comes into play. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions for the staff? Thank you, Mike. Yes, sir. And Mr. Bethay is here to answer any questions. Okay. You have them. Thank you. Um, just for the people that are here in most municipalities, um, all that I know of, these plans don't go to the Planning and Zoning Commission. They simply go to the uh, Building Department directly. In Fairhope, we have this just so people can look at um, and see what's going on. This is not a public hearing, but would anybody wish to speak to this item? Um, if not, um, Commissioners, John is in the audience. If you have any specific questions for him, and Mike is here as well. I was curious, just because the, um, I'm looking at more of a site plan, but is there any residential on the ground floor? Or is there sort of an entry? You just go straight up. Okay, and residential all second floor. And the entrance is sort of back in that inside corner. Okay, they're really nice. Any other questions, concerns? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Motion, Mr. Chairman. I've got a motion to approve the staff recommendations with conditions. The only conditions are basically just housekeeping, a hold harmless agreement for the balcony overhang. The balcony must contain lighting 
and the sidewalk would be eight foot in width, which is nice when the Mardi Gras goes by. Mm -hmm. So I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed say nay. All right, motion to recommend it passes unanimously. All right, under old business, we do have two items. Correct, Buford? Yes, sir, Chairman, Commissioners. We do have one more zoning change case uh, before you. And this is uh, case ZC 18.15. Oh, that was Richard, so I was trying to skip it. I, um, <laughs> oh, I, I circled the wrong one on that. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Excuse me, I skipped over to the second page. We yes, sir. So ZC Zulu Charlie 18.15 Zoning Ordinance Amendment. And Chairman, Commissioners, we passed out prior to the meeting a copy of uh, Table 3-1, which is the use table. This is directly from the zoning ordinance. And I'll, uh, I'll ask Mr. Peterson to help us with the particulars on this, but be before we do that, what I'd like to point out, if you look, uh, if you look at your use table, and if you look at the, your far left column on the left side, you'll notice you have your dwelling, and then you have civic. If you go to the last line of the civic section, you'll notice one of those uses is a public utility. And if you, if you follow across going left to right, all of the items marked with a circle are permitted only on appeal and subject to special conditions. And you'll notice that that is consistent all the way across for any item marked public utility with the exception of R6. If you look at zoning district R6, which is a mobile home park district. Um, don't know the history on it, Chairman Commissioners. I won't confess to know the history on it, but it was not included as an allowable use. And so the request is, is to add that. All uses. Make this, so the request, the, the, the request is to make that in all uses. So you notice an R6, um, the R3TH, the R3PGH, and so forth. And so with that, um, I'll ask Mr. Peterson to illuminate yeah, the details. And the background of that mm -hmm. is, we're, you know, we're trying to install new lift sta or, or substations within the city and upgrading some and, and relocating some. And the, some of the properties that are available happen to be in, a, in the M6 mobile home district. It's on the corner of uh, the northwest corner of Young and, and uh, Nichols. And which is right across the street from where the existing substation is. But anyway, so anyway, we're trying to get all our, our details established on getting the proper permissions. And I talked to Wayne about was there any kind of use on appeal or any other kind of requirement we needed to do with the planning commission in order to relocate this substation. And it turns out that there, there's uh, parts of the zoning ordinance wouldn't allow us to put a uh, substation on that property and uh, what you know what what I'm trying to accomplish is to put substations where you know it's not an issue of land use where you put critical infrastructure in terms of utility sometimes it's a geographical decision and sometimes it's an infrastructure uh, condition within itself that di dictates where these things go and, and none of those things have to do with the particular allowable usage based on a zone. So I, I just thought it would be appropriate to allow utility infrastructure to be installed in any zone, you know, with a use on appeal being approved by the Planning Commission to at least understand the circumstance by which that infrastructure is going to be, you know, required. And so, uh, you know, I obviously think that we should amend the zoning ordinance or at least recommend to the council that we amend it so that we do have that availability of sites that, that lend themselves to an economic opportunity for putting in infrastructure, utility, you know, related infrastructure. Well, Richard and Richard, with y'all's past experience at other municipalities, this is kind of unusual what we have here that it's not allowed in all of the zonings, isn't it? I, I don't know that I've ever seen a zoning ordinance that accepted any utility infrastructure from a zone. It seems to me like all of them have been always on use on appeal. But now, and I say that, we've got, you know, subdivisions with 
different types of infrastructure, whether it be lift stations or the primary, you know, uh, types of infrastructure you see. And, you know, they're pretty much wherever they're dictated based on the geography of the land, which is a topography, you know, and toward the bottom of the hill. And, and, and you know, we try to blend into what we can with the surrounding area where, you know, these infrastructure requirements are. And I don't know that it should be dictated based on the land use as much as the requirement for the utility to, to have the infrastructure where the infrastructure needs to be. Absolutely. And, and by the way, it would not go to the planning and zoning. It would go to the Board, Board of Adjustments. Adjustments. And we probably in the future should look at that because it seems like it would go to the planning and zoning because it would be more along the lines of the, you know, the, the subdivisions and the, you know, subdivision layouts and the and the zoning itself, then, you know, when you think of the Board of Adjustments, you think of special appeals for special circumstances, and I don't think of lift stations and things like that. I think of that more along the lines of an 1152.11 um, kind of review, and I wonder maybe, you know, asking around, seeing in other municipalities whether those go to Board of Adjustments as a special appeal or whether they're more like 1152.11 review that we do. Um, I don't know. But anyway, Ken, is there any reference in the statutes about how to approve infrastructure? Because you usually think of the board of adjustments as making special exceptions, you know. But but anyway, I'll go ahead. That's a that's a discussion for yes, another sir. day. We need to get this done now. Um, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing at this time. Does anybody wish to speak to ZC eighteen fifteen? Yes, sir. The uh, I, I just have a, a concern uh, about fully understanding the uh, risks and nuisance characteristics of certain public utility uh, equipment, devices, stations, and so on. Uh, is, is that all clearly understood by uh, everyone involved in considering improving, uh, implementing such things? in? these uh, various zoning districts? It's a good question. Yeah, I think it's odd that it's just a few zoning that's left out of it. It's like if you're going to leave it, if it's in, you know, why is it in B2 but not B4? Why is it in R4 and not R6, R5 and R6? It doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense why it would be allowed in an apartment but not a mobile home park or, a, you know, B2 and not a B4. I, I can't answer your question about what all we understand, but it's just, counterintuitive it just looks like somebody took a magic marker and kind of put some random circles down and I can't understand why they wouldn't allow it upon a pill the reason it goes upon a pill is exactly what you said so you know somebody says gosh do we want you know a utility substation right next door to a playground for kids um, but I think Richard would probably not do that anyway. Well, and that's, what, that's but, what I think the purpose but, but that's of the appeal why an, is. That's why you there know, is the an appeal, the appeal in there. For the people who are you know, charged with making that decision to understand, you know, what, what the, the facility would do to the landscape around it and, and how they buffer it from the, the uses around. I think that's exactly right. I, and, I, and I think a bigger question to the appeal is why can you appeal for R4 and not R6? Or why can you make appeal to B2 and not B4? It's well, it, it says right on, on the front page of the, of the memo, appeals reviewed, in this case, by the Zoning Board of Adjustment, or reviewed against the following criteria, and you've got uh, six or eight or ten of them that are listed here, and one of them at the very end, impacts on adjacent property, mm -hmm. uh, including noise, traffic, visible intrusions, potential physical impacts, and property <coughs> values. So, it, I mean, it's kind of a kind of a catch-all in terms of how I would anticipate Richard and, and, uh, and, and his crowd would, uh, would uh, factor in. It's a, right. it's a catch-all, but it seems pretty loose, and I realize this is a little rabbit hole here um, because it, it, to me it begs the question, I, th I think it's reasonable that it should, uh, the way it currently is seems unreasonable, and it's reasonable that we get a little more consistent in it being allowed. I'd like to have cl a clearer process and clearer design standards. I mean, it seems like a mark of really nice cities is that the infrastructure isn't, intrusive and when it does exist it's not it's it's beautiful you know it's not glaringly ugly and you know you go 
I mean, one example, very expensive example, but you go to New Orleans and there are these beautiful brick buildings that have pump stations in them. And um, I think we should sort of strive in that direction. And I'd, I'd like to know how we can get there with maybe more specific language or specific design standards for this infrastructure. And Chairman Commissioners, uh, just to reiterate for, for our audience, uh, both here and watching too, is to understand that the, the Board of Adjustments process is a public hearing just like we consider zoning changes, subdivisions, et cetera. We go through the same type of meeting, just heard by a different board, um, heard by a different board appointed. And so therefore, in this case, you'd have city staff they would have to make their case and make their justification to that board. And so that board would have the authority to approve, deny, table, add conditions of approval, et cetera. So though not necessarily, as Ms. Bryan is saying, a, a, a standard at this point, but there would definitely be a vetting process and heard by an external board where you would have a public hearing. So the, the public can understand they at least have that opportunity mm -hmm. to have advertisement. If a piece of infrastructure is going in a particular area, they have the opportunity to uh, make comments about that infrastructure and let that, let that board consider the case. And, and ask for buffering or ask to make it more attractive. Is, uh, really, that was, there was a question buried in that whole thing. Is, is there something I'm missing? Um, you know, in the discussions I've heard about lift stations, it's been, you know, here's a paint color and here's a here's a screen or a fence is that is there anything else we have? I, I think you know we're going through the replacement of the lift station at the bottom of Fells Avenue on Mobile Street mm -hmm. and and I you know everybody has their own opinion about what looks attractive and what doesn't but in the process of talking about all the different options which some you know had some type of artist you know how the I-10 when you get into Pensacola has the blue angels on the, mm -hmm. on the, well, you know, we talked about trying to build some type of solid looking wall with some type of, you know, artwork, if you will, I, that's debatable too, but, you know, and then we started looking at, well, the view of the bay is sometimes more important, so now we're looking at more of a low profile picket fence to put around it, mm -hmm. but we're trying to, to take the low profile picket fence and and create some uh, offsets in it so that the electrical equipment can fit within that offset in the landscape and can kind of be around it so you really don't see what is above ground of that lift station so to answer your question every site kind of has its own requirements for what constitutes blending into the surrounding area and I I think our goal is to try to do the best we can to accomplish that mm -hmm. I, I you know, but I think it's just one of these things that with every project you have to weigh, well, what could we have done better and try to accomplish that on the next one if there is something you could have done better. And right now, when we look at the lift station that we're looking at at the bottom of the hill, we're looking at a little more open, a, you know, a less, you know, obvious structure because you know it points toward utility infrastructure in what we think is a protected bluff along the bay so that's you know i, I don't know if that answered your question but we do care and we do try uh, yeah. it's and that's that. what i think is important about being able to represent <coughs> these things to an entity that you know has those considerations to 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 weigh on and, and judge to approve or not to approve and i'm happy with that Uh, any other questions, comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. I have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, motion passed unanimously. Um, now we have two extension requests um, that are coming up. Buford? Yes, sir. And so, commissioners, I'm going to read this into the record. The first request for extension is the case number SD 16.34. This is Old Battles Village Phase 4. The request is for a two-year extension of the preliminary plat approval. Okay. Um, Emily? 
Have we, in the past, I was talking to Ken before the meeting, and he said there's nothing in the, uh, you know, any of our ordinances or, or subdivision regs that say we can or that say we cannot do this. In the past, though, I'm thinking maybe you or Nancy can remember, haven't we typically done one-year extensions? Yes, that is correct. It's been one year, typically. That's kind of the precedent that we have set in the past. Yes, it is. That's what I was thinking. But does it preclude two years? Pardon? I was just asking about the precedent of what we've done in the past since this is not um, in our subdivision ordinances that normally we've just gone a year at a time. And Art was asking if that would preclude us doing a two-year extension. There's no provision against granting this extension or expressing authorizing. I think what we're, I think what we're hearing is that the commission has, as a matter of custom or practice in the past, uh, allowed such extensions for, based on some kind of show and call. From a legal perspective, I don't, I don't see an issue with granting, granting uh, an extension consistent with you know, what we've done in the past. Well, I, I think it just be, it begs the issue of of uh, starting starting a precedent that you can't carry forward. And what and what is it then? Is it, if it's one year, but then is it two years? And if it's two, is it four? If we don't have a uh, a rule and a reg, then maybe we need one. I make a motion that we make the extension for a one year. I have a motion. Do I have a second? A second. I have a second. Um, any further discussion? Who put it for Charles, so we'll see that he was here. <laughs> um, any further? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That was the old Battles Village. The next item, what is, I don't have the S. And Chairman Commissioners, uh, case number SD 16.27 Fairhope Falls phase two and three uh, same request two-year extension of the prelimin preliminary plat approval Okay. I make the same request for um, a one-year extension a motion for a one-year extension do I have a second? second any further all in favor say aye. aye aye any opposed say nay all right we've got uh, some green space discussion Buford's got some slides to show us and he promised he's not going into any math equations today <laughs> no sir commissioners <laughs> no, <laughs> commissioners um, we will uh, I will save our lecture on compatibility analysis for another time <laughs> uh, but I hope to captivate you about that again in the future um, again apologies for mr. dice and uh, and he was hoping to present this to you tonight I am going to stumble through this as best I can but we wanted to provide the Commission with some some information to ponder and to invite that hopefully it would solicit some feedback about uh, green space this is a uh, green space and open space we've talked about this previously um, the first slide right here you'll notice that uh, we contemplated this and I think Wayne verbalized this to the Commission in a previous meeting as possibly creating a staggered open space requirement mm -hmm. so for example if you had a development with a uh, density of less than two units per acre, make that open space about 10%. Um, if you had two to four units per acre, 15%, 20%, four to six, more than six units per acre, 25%, set it at 10% for an MOP. And currently, the current subdivision regulation requirement is 10%. Now, it specifies 10% green space. So our engineers clarify the amount of green space within their various common areas. Can I and that is, you real quick? Sir. Why would an MOP have a separate 10% rather than being governed by the density of the MOP just like everything else? That is an excellent point. That is an excellent, that's an excellent point, point of feedback. Now, I think it would depend upon depend upon the development because an MOP can span an MOP can vary in so many different ways um, but that's a good point that is a good point that we'll consider is uh, either either I don't know if we would want to mirror that of a typical subdivision but possibly create a staggered uh, a staggered green space requirement similar to 
a typical subdivision because I could see that being necessary, for example, if you have an MOP in the CBD where there is no available space for a green space. Um, I could see that possibly being a, a factor there. So we'll certainly take that under advisement. Um, just moving on here just a bit, uh, we want to introduce a term into your vernacular of net density and gross density. We mentioned net density on this slide right there, on this slide before you. And so the sub, the, not the subdivision regulations, but the zoning ordinance actually contemplates net density and gross density when it's primarily talking about the village districts, the NVCs, CVCs, and CVCs, which we don't have anyone has zoned any area in, in Fairhope right now, but it is in the subdivision regulations. And what we're talking about net density is what would the density be if you removed all the land from a development with the exception of what is buildable. That would, what would be your net density in that case? It would generate higher density numbers. So we want to introduce that and put that into the vernacular. It's something you'll hear your staff talking about again in the, in the future. Um, I, I'll, commissioners, I won't, I'll try not to go on ad nauseum, but I do want to put another, another item into your vernacular, and that is your rural to urban transect zones. Um, it's a bit small on your slide, so I apologize for that, but this is something you certainly may want to research on your own. You'll notice your, your transects beginning with the least dense, the most, um, the most rural would be a T1, and then going all the way to T6 or SD, those would be your urban transects. Um, the transect nomenclature is derived from the new urbanist movement um, and is actually based upon the SMART code. And some of you may know some cities and counties actually adopt SMART code and use it as their governing document. This is derived from that and this is another <coughs> way to explain your density transition you hear us talk about. This is another way of describing it. This, the two, the, uh, the two images on your slide right here, these, this is actually some guidance that is within the zoning ordinance. Typically, we're following the subdivision regulations, um, but this is an area that we're evaluating for, we're evaluating how it lives within the zoning ordinance. And so you will see that we begin using this guidance for future recommendations. Um, I will confess we are just now beginning to absorb uh, this information, but it gives plazas, greenways, and again, it's a bit small on your slide, but I just wanted to introduce this into the Commission's vernacular. This will be something you will see. We'll synthesize this and make recommendations. Um, one of the things that Wayne commented here on this particular one is to add some additional columns to actually make some location recommendations for those types of green spaces. Um, if I can just yes, thank you, Emily. interject right here. Um, these, this table is part of the zoning <coughs> ordinance right now. Wayne is looking at taking that and actually inserting it into the subregs um, to use in the subregs to give um, guidance on how to use these and obviously by adding the location on where to use these. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. That's right. So uh, um, I kind of, like I said, I, I, I told you, Mr. Turner, I would kind of stumble through this tonight. Um, but you'll see this. You'll see this. So it's very likely you'll see uh, a future recommendation from your staff um, to, as Emily said, to incorporate this into your subdivision regulations. Um, Wayne included some, uh, some, some nice photos giving a better example, beginning with a green. And you'll notice here how it's bordered by rights of way on at least two sides um, and the various criteria he included in here. And some additional photos right here. Apparently, it looks looks like one during the winter time where the uh, grass is frost killed. Um, another another good example here. Notice the building facades beyond <coughs> when you look at street level. An additional example. And another similar one. Um, 
the uh, and you'll know you know you'll note the one in the lower right hand corner, um, a large green right there. Uh, bordered with the sidewalk. So I think what you have there is a good opportunity. Another item that we've kind of introduced in the Commission's vernacular is uh, passive versus active recreation. So absolutely a very, an adequate area for some passive recreation, no doubt, um, right there that could possibly be used for active recreation. Um, here, he, uh, another, another example, the trail greenway, an undeveloped area, continuous linear natural features. Uh, often following a stream or a flood plain, um, 30 feet wide and a minimum of three acres. And then again, that's right out of the zoning ordinance. Uh, a plaza uh, for civic commercial activities bordered by public right of way on at least two sides. Um, the building facades define its boundary. Um, note here an eight to two acres um, determined by the height surrounding the building. So this is where you would have your height, uh, your height to, uh, to uh, width ratio. Um, as you see right there in that recommendation. Um, a courtyard, uh, a good example in the upper left right there. Uh, small open space serving one or a few, one or a few surrounding buildings, uh, bordered by building facades, one side fully or partially bordered by a public right of way. Um, and you notice the, two to the, uh, uh, the building height ratios included right there. Um, a park, self-explanatory, but uh, Natural area, unstructured recreation, so not necessarily playing fields, that type of thing. Um, may include structured recreation, no more than 25%. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke there. Uh, featured convenience, and but note the size of at least three acres. And so, commission members, what the, what the desire of your staff is to solicit your comments, which you're welcome to provide to staff. You're welcome to email to Wayne, or you're certainly welcome to email it to me or, or, or Ms. Boyette or any of your staff. Um, and what we do wish to do is synthesize your comments, your feedback, as well as staff recommendations. Synthesize that into a recommendation that we can bring before you on the January 7th Planning Commission meeting. Thank you, Buford. Could you, um, if you could send a copy of this to, um, Jack Burrell, he, whenever he serves on our committee, he's yes, always, you know, questions the green space and the percentages very much. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry he isn't here tonight, but um, what we will do is we'll take this meeting's, the entire meeting slideshow, we'll put it into SharePoint. Uh, we'll place it into SharePoint where everyone can, where everyone will have access to it, especially this rear portion. And so uh, the council president has certainly shared on that as well. Good. And I think you did a great job today, Buford, uh, stepping in last minute for Wayne. Because uh, when I talked to Wayne at 2.30, he was planning on being here, so you didn't have much time. And I think you did an excellent job. I Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, um, I, uh, you know, I make no... I, I make no excuses. If I, I if I intend to stumble through it, I'll warn you in advance. <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you. That's um, great. I'm really, really excited about this green space. Yes, ma'am, and I think that um, I think the potential to see this appear in MOPs uh, where appropriate will certainly be beneficial. Um, but that's a great suggestion, commissioners, about possibly having a staggered criteria for MOPs. Um, we certainly, certainly appreciate that comment. And guys, please look at this in detail because this is the kind of thing that I think a lot of times we gloss over in, in meetings. You know, we wish we had it more. And when I say in detail, I mean both the spirit and then how it's written, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. you know, how it's written as far as how it would be implemented. But uh, looks excellent. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.